you, everybody. Uh, please continue enjoying your uh, enjoying your lunch. We're just going to get started here, but uh, you know, please enjoy your. You should be on dessert by now. Please enjoy your dessert and coffee, uh, or finish your lunch if you haven't finished eating yet. I'm Keith Richburg, the president of the uh, club. And before we get started and introduce our distinguished guests, I want to let you know about a couple of things coming up. First of all, we're really glad that we've been able to restart our FCC film nights, uh, which are going to be on Monday. Uh, the next one coming up this coming Monday is called The Six. It's an amazing story about the uh, six Chinese survivors uh, from the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, it's called The Six. It's going to be on Monday. Now, unfortunately, I'm told that it may be sold out, but get yourself on the waiting list. And uh, if we have enough people on the waiting list, we can also do a second showing of the film as well. So that's another reason to get yourself on the waiting list. So people do drop out. So if it's, it's closed, do that. We've got another great film coming up uh, later on. Uh, it's going to come up on the 18th of July, also on a Monday. We try to do our films on Monday evenings. This one is called We Don't Dance for Nothing. It's a film about the uh, entrapment and freedom experienced by domestic helpers uh, here in Hong Kong. The film is called We Don't Dance for Nothing. There's still space available for that one. Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm told it's a terrific film. And we've also got a lot of good uh, speaking events and panels coming up including one coming up on July uh, 14th, which is Bastille Day. So if you're not celebrating Bastille Day, please come to our luncheon panel. This one is uh, called COVID-19 in Hong Kong. What's, come, what's next? We all want to know that. <laughs> so, uh, and we've got uh, Professor Ben Cowling, Dr. Ben Cowling from the University of Hong Kong. You may have seen him a lot on RTHK giving talks. And uh, Aaron Bush, if you follow Twitter, he's known as Tripperhead. <laughs> so you may have uh, seen him as well. And I hope you've been enjoying the, uh, the little slideshow we presented here. Uh, just getting ready for this, you know, this is the 25th anniversary. Our speaker is part of our 25th anniversary events. We've got a, a, a photo exhibit downstairs on the wall. But, uh, you know, what? I was uh, going through looking for some things, I came across this edition, the 1997, July 97 edition of the FCC magazine, The Correspondent. And uh, I might, uh, if you look there, you might see some faces you recognize, including a 25-year younger version of myself. <laughs> uh, there, um, I did have hair at one time, and it was black. Um, and, but you know, we, we actually hired that year. We actually hired an artist to come in and do some artistic renditions of some of our speakers there. And this is uh, Mr. Jasper Zhang Yak Sing, who's our speaker today, uh, an artist rendition of him. He was not actually on the same panel with. Uh, with Emily Lau, but there's a photo of her and there's a sketch illustration of slightly younger looking, <laughs> a younger looking version of our speaker. So I thought you might enjoy that as well. But um, our speaker, Jasper Zhang Yak Singh, as I said, he was, um, he began his teaching career here in Hong Kong at the uh, Pui Q Middle School and became principal in 1986. But in 92, he began his political career with the founding of the Democratic Alliance for the Betterment of Hong Kong. And he remained as chairman of the party until 2003. In his distinguished career, he served on many bodies, including the uh, CPPCC, the Provisional LegCo, uh, the Executive Council, and he was ex uh, elected to the Legislative Council in 1998 and served as president for eight years, correct, if I'm not mistaken, for two terms. And uh, he has been awarded the Grand Bohemia Medal. And he, is, uh, he has been teaching at the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, I think, but maybe taking a bit of a hiatus now until they can tempt him back. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Jasper Zhang Yak Singh, you got a few words for us first, and then we'll just jump right into the Q&A. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Keith. And, and <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very glad to see all of you here. Um, so let me begin with the... Um, with President Xi's remarks last week. So he has said it. One country, two systems is not going to uh, terminate in 2047. It's going to continue for a long time beyond the uh, promised 30 year period. Mm -hmm. The president also mentioned a number of what he called unique strengths of Hong Kong, uh, which should be uh, preserved in the years to come. And, and these include free economy, an open and free business environment, good connection for the rest of the world, and a common law system. The president said, 
he would like to see Hong Kong in future attracting more people from all over the world to realize their dreams here in Hong Kong. He would like to see more extensive um, cooperations, exchanges between Hong Kong and other places. So he told us, one country, two systems is going to advance steadily in the right direction. Okay. Is this direction the same as the one you would like to see in the coming years? Well, I, uh, I watched the uh, <clears throat> Zoom meeting of the FCC with the Professor Tang Weiwei last, last week. And I heard Keith asking Professor Dang what he thought Deng Xiaoping would think if he saw Hong Kong today. Right? And when you ask that question, Keith, the look in your eyes seemed to uh, tell that you didn't think that Deng Xiaoping would like what he, see, what he would see in Hong Kong today. Right? <laughs> Didn't know I was so transparent in my looks. <laughs> <laughs> but when I heard your question, another question came into my mind. What would Deng Xiaoping think if he saw what happened in Hong Kong in 2019? What do you think? Do you think seeing what happened in 2019, Deng Xiaoping would hesitate? to bring in and impose in Hong Kong, impose on Hong Kong a national security law? Do you think he would allow the Hong Kong legislature or, the Hong, or any elected institution in Hong Kong to be dominated by people who would be more friendly with the United States than with the PRC? So, I mean, if, if we see that China or Chinese government has been tightening its control over Hong Kong, let me point out that every time the central government decided to change its policies in Hong Kong, of course, the, 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 the so-called fundamental policy is one country, two systems. And, and the uh, Chinese leadership, they have always uh, stressed that uh, they, they are insisting in that fundamental policy. But we, we notice that from time to time, changes or adjustments to, to specific policies on Hong Kong did take place. And I would say that every change so made, I would see it as in response to what happens in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Chinese leaders, they don't simply wake up one day and say, look, we have to change this. Mm -hmm. They see what happened, what happens in Hong Kong, and they, they, they make up their mind. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, if, if we see, if we want to tell what's, what Hong Kong is going to be like in the next uh, two and a half decades. Of course, we know that that will depend on, on the policy of the, Chinese, of the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party, right? Maybe there are still some who believe that, that the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government are going to collapse very soon. But I don't think many people will subscribe to that idea any, anymore. <clears throat> so the Chinese Communist Party will be there the, the Chinese, the PRC government will be there. And we all know that what's going to happen in Hong Kong and how Hong Kong will do in the next uh, two and a half decades will depend on China's policy on Hong Kong. And if we regard China's policy on Hong Kong as subject to the whims of the, of the patriarch, there's no logic, no, no, no reason behind that. Then it, it doesn't help us. I mean, 
it, can, it can't do us any good. As I see it, I believe that the Chinese leadership, in, including the current leadership, they do want to see one country, two systems succeed in Hong Kong and succeed in a way appreciated by Hong Kong people and people elsewhere. Not only the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party saying, look, it is a great success in Hong Kong, but they want Hong Kong people and other people in other places as well to agree. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how can you attract people to Hong Kong? So they want to see that. But at the same time, of course, they don't want anything happening in Hong Kong to endanger the country's national security or to challenge China's um, sovereignty over Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, they have laid down all the rules right from the start. Mm -hmm. And they have kept reminding us of those rules. For example, five years ago, when Xi Jinping visited Hong Kong I mean, at our 20th anniversary, he warned that any action that challenges China's sovereignty over Hong Kong cannot be tolerated. He, he said that very clearly, mm -hmm. right? And so the rules are there. What uh, adjustments, what, what, what changes in Beijing's uh, policies of Hong Kong will very much depend on what we do here. So, so, I mean, I think all of us in Hong Kong, we do have a very important role to play in shaping our own future. It is not that we are, no, we are, we are helpless. We have to, we can only wait to see how the whim of the, uh, of, of, of the Chinese leadership goes. Mm. So, I mean, let me stop here. I think, I think all of you would enjoy dialogue more than my monologue. <laughs> let me stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Well, let, let, let me start with something that uh, I saw you quoted in the South China Morning Post not long ago saying that I believe it's, I'm paraphrasing here, that one, mm -hmm. the success of one country, two systems is going to depend partly on whether or not there can be some accommodation made with the pan-democrats and those who are now kind of on the outside. Could you explain what you, you meant when you were talking about that need to kind of bring the sides together again? The, um, <clears throat> well, we, we, we all know what the term pan-democrats mm -hmm. stand for, right? I mean, all of us who have I mean, living in Hong Kong, we has been through the, uh, the past uh, 25 years, including the last few years. We know, we know that term, pan-democrats, mm -hmm. stand, stands for that um, political camp, let's say, in Hong Kong, um, <clears throat> which up to now is still supported by a sizable proportion of our population. And that's my belief. Mm -hmm. That is why, that is one reason why the turnout rate in our last uh, legislative elections, mm -hmm. in the December elections, was, was, was so low because, because many, many voters didn't find uh, mm -hmm. the candidates, the youth to support mm -hmm. um, coming out to, 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 to stand in that election, right? That's right. So, so, so I mean, we have Still, a large proportion of the Hong Kong population uh, behind the so-called pan Democrats, mm -hmm. and uh, and and if uh, the because because Xi Jinping also stressed the importance of uh, a harmonious and stable mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. if you want harmony, if you want stability, mm -hmm. you no, know, I, I believe the central government must let. All Hong Kong people see that they are willing to uh, sort of mm -hmm. communicate mm -hmm. with all all the parties, including those uh, they support. Mm -hmm. So the people came out in big numbers in November 2019 for the district council election. Seventy percent voted, yeah. and they voted. They, the pan Democrats in that camp swept. 
the election. So people have said pretty clearly what they want. That, that, that was the beginning of our trouble. <laughs> you see, I mean, I mean, I just said that uh, the uh, uh, changes in uh, Beijing's policies towards Hong Kong have taken place, all taken place, in response to what happened, in, what happened here. Now, let me put it this way. If, if the uh, so-called turbulence in 2019 had not happened, I believe, I believe that Beijing would still be waiting patiently for us to legislate on our own to protect national security. I mean, according to, uh, in accordance with the Article 23, mm. of the basic law, mm. right? If the 2019 situation had not developed that way, mm. I believe, because they had waited for more than 20 years, mm. right? Very patiently. Similarly, if, if the pan-democrats had not been carried away by their victory in the uh, district council elections and openly declared that they were going to win a similar victory mm -hmm. in the electoral elections, which uh, originally was scheduled mm -hmm. to take place in 2020, and, and winning the majority in the electoral, they said they were going to bring the SAL government to its knees. Mm -hmm. Right? Not only that. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who was uh, perhaps uh, among those masterminding the, uh, the election in, in, in 2020, he said, after the electoral elections, they were going to win a large number of seats in the election committee as well. The election committee for choosing the chief executive. And he said, then we would have a very strong say, much stronger say on who our next chief executive should be. Mm -hmm. And when he told me this, I asked him, do you think Beijing would allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. And he said, in genuine surprise, what can Beijing do? <laughs> the whole world is watching. <laughs> <laughs> so now he knows. Yeah. Well, t let's, let's talk about that for a bit, because these, the 47 who participated in the primary election are still in jail, almost a year and a half now and their trials haven't happened yet. Some of them must have been people you worked with closely in yes. LegCo. Do you really believe that they, they are they, they, guilty of subversion and, and endangering national security, these people you worked with? Taking part in the primary election is no offense. It is not an offense to take part in the primary election. But, but and, and, and I mean, if you check, not everybody who took part in the primary election uh, has been uh, prosecuted, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they were, they, were, they were arrested and, and, and maybe prosecuted because of suspected offenses uh, defined in the, uh, in the new national security law. Four very specific offenses and they were very, very uh, clearly targeted. Either you sort of call for Hong Kong independence to try to break Hong Kong away from China, or you want to subvert the uh, so-called uh, government institutions. And I believe most of them, perhaps, uh, were suspected of uh, having committed this, this, this offense. As I said earlier, what, what, what they told the public mm -hmm. was, look, we are going to win, we are going to win a majority of the seats in Let's Go, and after that, mm -hmm. we will make the government accede to our political demands. But isn't that what political parties are supposed to do? That's isn't what, the opposition in France just run saying, we want to win a majority in the parliament so we can stop Emmanuel Macron's agenda? Right. That's what you're supposed to do, right? That's what the they, Republicans in the U.S. say they want to win a majority in the Congress so they can stop by. No, no, they will form the government. Hmm? I mean, they, 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 they will be the government. No. I mean, no. They, that's what, that's what uh, some political parties do during a color revolution. This is what makes it so serious. But shouldn't the, their goal have been to win a majority of seats in Lechko? 
that's why they ran, correct? Yes. Well, it depends on on what I mean. As I as I said earlier, taking part in the in the uh, primary, uh, aiming at winning a majority of the seats in Lechko, there's no there's no no offense at all. Mm -hmm. So why were they arrested? But I, I've already said that they they declared in public, and some of them actually uh, sort of signed a sort of a declaration mm -hmm. that after they do that, they're going to force the government to accede to the demands, including the demands, for example, including reopening the uh, constitutional uh, reform exercise on their terms, not on the terms of the central government. But even if they had won and with this agenda, wouldn't they just be representing the majority of Hong Kong people who voted for them? Well, that's, uh, I believe, disputable. <laughs> that's disputable. I mean, do the, 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 the opposition side, the opposition camp won, of course, a vast majority of the seats in the district councils in, uh, in uh, 2019. Do they represent the people? Do they represent the people? Now, ask the Hong Kong people, those members of the, of the district council who got elected in, uh, this, in, in, in November 2019, were they performing the kind of duties that uh, Hong Kong, most Hong Kong people expect them to perform? You mean in their district was, council was, jobs? The, 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 the election results, we all know, mm -hmm. the election results were the consequences of, of one of the consequences of the uh, 2019 protests. Mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, well, did I mention uh, foreign interference? I was going to ask you about foreign interference. I, you know, I, I'm not a working journalist anymore, but I went out and looked at some of the early protests in June of 2019 and July of 2019, and I saw middle class couples, I saw people with baby carriages, I saw you know, I don't know if it was a million people, but hundreds of thousands of people walking pretty peacefully. Were they all manipulated by foreign forces? Well, Keith, you, you, you have seen the world. I guess what we saw in Hong Kong in 2019, you know, uh, mothers going in the streets with, the, with the children, uh, not very different from what happened in other places when a color revolution is taking place, mm -hmm. right? So th this is how it this is how it happens. Mm -hmm. This is how color revolutions go. But do you really think that they all those people who went out there were there because they were manipulated by foreign forces? Not not consciously. I I mean, let me tell you this. An Amer American diplomat said to me towards the end of uh, of 2019. You know, he said, "Look, we understand very well why Beijing." says that we are behind the protests in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. right? They have to find mm -hmm. an explanation. Mm -hmm. But Mr. Zhang, having been in Hong Kong for so long, you don't believe that, do you? Mm -hmm. And so I said, look, uh, sir, we, uh, ever since the protests have started in Hong Kong, all your politicians, all the politicians in America, have spoken vocally in support of the protesters. Mm -hmm. You have described what's happening in Hong Kong as Hong Kong people fighting for democracy, fighting against him, of course, fighting against China, fighting against Beijing, mm -hmm. right? And those, the leaders of the opposition, the leaders of the protesters against, against the Hong Kong government, they went to the United States and they were received by very high ranking officials in the United States, mm -hmm. right? And your government, your politicians, and you say, Hong Kong people, we are with you. We are with you. So I said, look, uh, a former US uh, consul general in Hong Kong told me several, back uh, I think 10 years ago, with pride, how he witnessed his government, the American government, supporting 
color revolutions in some of the uh, Central Asian states. We help the people to overthrow the, uh, the dictator. Right? So I said, now, if your government and your politicians see that a democratic movement is going on in Hong Kong, that the Hong Kong people are fighting valiantly for democracy, can the CIA sit back and do nothing? I would say that would be dereliction of duty. <laughs> but you would agree that the people went out on their own. This wasn't the, the CIA. The CIA could not get out of Afghanistan when no. they needed to get out of Afghanistan. They can't do anything correctly, right? Of, well, I think whether, what, I would be very surprised indeed if the CIA doesn't play any part in uh, color revolutions elsewhere. But I believe that even elsewhere, whenever a color revolution is taking place, you ask the people, are you being manipulated by the United States? No one will say, yes, we are manipulated by, by the United States. <laughs> they are going on this. In, well, that, that is the secret of color revolution. Everybody believes that they are, they are, they are fighting for a lofty goal mm -hmm. on their own, all right? Mm -hmm. And then there is a change of regime. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. From the protests and, and other events from 2019, there are now more than 1,000. I've lost count now. Thousands of people in jail, young people, many of them students. Uh, at some point, they're going to get out of jail. Uh, they can't go back to university because they lost their places. They probably can't get jobs because it's on their record that they've been in prison. How do you reintegrate them back into society? I, I think there are people, there are organizations who are working hard uh, on that, mm -hmm. including some um, government institutions as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. but, but again, yes, when you say oh, we have a a thousand people, including many, many young students, arrested, spending time in jail. We've never seen that happen in Hong Kong before, and we have never seen so many people, including young people, going in the streets, uh, involved in very violent acts. We have never seen that. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong people, we've always, we, we used to pride ourselves very much on uh, our peaceful demonstrations, the peacefulness of all the massive uh, 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 demonstrations in Hong Kong. But in 2019, no. Mm -hmm. People got, I mean, we all know. Mm -hmm. But, but as, as I mentioned, at some point, they're going to come out of prison. Pardon? At some point, they'll be out of prison. Yes. You're going to have a huge, angry population and the government's response, the central government's response, seems to be we have to do things to make them love China. We have to make them more patriotic. But you're, they're going to be coming out of prison. As I, as I said, I believe the government, including the uh, uh, Correction and Services Department, uh, are trying to, uh, to help these young people uh, adapt themselves in the uh, in the society when they come out. Many of them, well, when you, when, when you commit a crime, not most of them. Well, some were convicted for carrying laser pointers or, or having zip ties on their backpacks. Well, they, you, they, they, don't, they don't get heavy punishments on that. No. But they still serve time in jail. And, well, not only because you own some laser point, laser pens, I don't think so. You see, I, you know, you know I, was, I was in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, Polytech University, um, uh, it was on the 18th of November. Yeah. Uh, when, 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 when the students were there. Yeah, the Poly UC. I went there, and, when, and, when, and then I, I, tried to, I tried to persuade the students to go out, to leave the campus peacefully. Mm -hmm. we, got, we got promises from the police. Mm -hmm. If they come out, if they come out peacefully, then the police would not uh, sort of uh, 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 stop them. Right? I try to persuade them to come out, and and there, there was this young girl, mm -hmm. shot at him, shot at him. She came, listened to me, and then walked away again. Came a second time, came a third time, and finally she asked, 
Look, when we go out, will we be charged with rioting? Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, they need evidence. Mm -hmm. If you haven't done anything that uh, constitutes uh, the offense of rioting, you wouldn't be charged. Mm -hmm. And she said, but uh, I was on television throwing petrol bombs. That's what she said. So it is, it's very heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I don't think this young girl really knew what she was doing. Mm -hmm. But she was doing it because everybody else was doing it. Mm -hmm. young, young people, they went in the, 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 uh, the, the MTR stations and smashed everything because everybody was doing it. Mm -hmm. so, so that was... That was the case in 2019. Yeah. Uh, I want to get to some audience questions. I just have a couple more. Um, let me ask you, just, I can't let you get away without one question about our former chief executive, Carrie Lam. What grade would you give her? <laughs> I never grade any... Uh, you don't get to do pass-fail. I, I don't want to be graded myself, so I don't, <laughs> I don't grade anyone. I mean, I think uh, all of us know uh, Carrie's... Uh, strengths and weaknesses, I think. Mm -hmm. I think uh, she started her term very, uh, I mean, she had a very good start. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Fred Lee is there. <laughs> I think she went to your party celebration, right? The Democratic Party. And uh, um, she, she was held in very high esteem, not only by uh, uh, many Hong Kong people, but by the central government state as well. I mean, for the first, for the first few years. So, so many people would say that uh, the uh, 2019 uh, protest uh, changed her, changed her fate. But, but, I mean, she just, just as the pan Democrats were carried away by their success in the uh, district council elections and made a very serious mistake. They made the fatal mistake of uh, sort of telling everybody that we would make use of the, uh, of the electoral elections to uh, bring the government to its knees. Carrie, she was, I believe she was a bit carried away by her, by her success up to the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. You see, you, do you all remember the uh, opening ceremony of the Guangzhou uh, out, the, the bridge? Yes, yeah, yeah. Huh? She was there and she was walking abreast with the, the president, <laughs> President Xi, ahead of uh, Handam, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, that's a boo-boo, that's, huh? that's a faux pas, you don't do that, right? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I mean she should, <laughs> I, well, she's, of course, she's a, a, a very experienced uh, a government official. She should, she should be very aware of the, well aware of the protocol. Mm -hmm. right? But, well, she was, maybe she, she felt that she had the, the honor. I mean, she deserved the honor. She deserved the right mm -hmm. to walk abreast with the, uh, with the president. <laughs> and, uh, and later that year, the same year, the end of uh, 2018, she led a delegation to Beijing. Uh, in, uh, uh, it was a celebration of the 40th anniversary of China's opening up, reform and opening up. I was, I was in the delegation and I saw, uh, I mean, the president himself, Xi Jinping himself, actually um, uh, loaded praises on her. <laughs> And, and she knew, she knew that she had the full trust and, uh, and uh, you know, of, of the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why, I believe, although there must have been many who advised against the, uh, the uh, FOO, the Fugitive, Offenders Ordinance Amendment. The extradition. Yes. 
I believe there was no lack of uh, uh, advisors around to carry advising against against her, but she was very confident. She said, I, I can do it, and only I can do it. You used the word confident. Huh? Confident. Pardon? You used the word confident. She was overconfident, you think? Yes. Yes, I think the, um, I, learned, I, I learned a word uh, when I was uh, studying uh, Greek mythology. It's called hubris. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll leave that there. <laughs> and just to work, before I get to the audience questions, so please think of your questions and let me see your hand. But one more for me. Uh, you're not on Exco now, but you can give so you can give some real outside advice to our new chief executive, John Lee. Disband Exco. Disband Exco. Exco to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you you talking about Exco, not Let's Go? No, oh, Exco now. Exco. You did you want to be on Exco? No. <laughs> Exco is, what's the word for it? Anachronism? Mm -hmm. Anachronism. Out of date. What, what is that? I mean, it, in all former, in, in, in all other places formerly ruled by the British, mm -hmm. because the British always, when they, when they, when, when they establish a colonial rule, mm -hmm. it's always, uh, they would always set up an executive council. But, but after the British left, the executive council usually would either they would be uh, you know dissolved, disbanded, mm -hmm. or transformed into the cabinet of the new government. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the exco in Hong Kong is. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exco members themselves. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what are they supposed to do? I mean, and and a lot depends. A lot depends on the chief executive because because it is up to the chief executive to decide who. Mm -hmm. will join the EXCO, mm -hmm. and it is up to the chief executive to decide you know, how much advice mm -hmm. from the LegCo members he will take. Mm -hmm. So, but what, what advice would you give uh, like Chief Executive John Lee in terms of like trying to bring Hong Kong together again and bridge this blue-yellow divide? He's doing fine. <laughs> so far. <laughs> He's doing fine. I mean, well, we have to wait. We have to wait a little bit. Um, uh, when, 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 when we talk of sort of rebuilding bridges or mending fences, mm -hmm. you, I mean, we need, we need the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the intention on both sides. Mm -hmm. If there is, I mean, I, I don't think the time, I don't think the time is ripe yet for uh, any, uh, Breakthrough, let's say, mm -hmm. in 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 communication between mm -hmm. between the government and uh, and the yellow camp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Not yet. <laughs> With the wait I'm I'm going to open it up for questions from all of you. Just first I, hand I see is right there, the black suit. <laughs> Please identify yourself for the audience. Uh, Kenneth Long, and our ex legislative council member. Uh, hello. President Zhang, um, of course, I mean, I, I heard about your view on the pan-democrats and, um, well, maybe it's partially correct. I mean, you, you must realize that there are many divergent views within the pan-democratic camps as well. But what you've told the audience probably is just one of the, maybe, the majority view or leading view. Now, one, one juncture I need to point out, um, that could be a breakthrough was in June, 2019, if you remember, um, there was a proposal to shelve uh, the Fugitive Offenders Ordinance. That was in late June. And in fact, I can tell the audience here, there were quite a few numbers in the pan-democratic camp who would be happy to accept the shelving proposal. But of course, that didn't come through. Uh, they were, this proposal was not acceptable by the other members. And what I want to, to know is if, if the proposal was shelved and you know, we, if we're happy about the shelving of the proposal, Mr. Chang, do you think the uh, central government would still have a very high-handed uh, policy including the imposition of the national security law on us? No. If the, 
but first of all, I must, I must, I must, um, uh, I must say, we should understand that that it would be a very difficult decision for the chief executive to make whether to go on with the uh, legislation or not, because um, because I mean, you know that by June. Uh, the the whole legislation business had become well. I don't want. I, I hate using this term, but I can't think of a better way to describe it. it became it's become very political in the sense that it was a uh, you know one side winning, the other side uh, uh, giving up. So so <clears throat> it was difficult. The but but. If it is a very, of, of course, a purely hypothetical <laughs> way of looking at it. If uh, the process had stopped earlier, then all the uh, um, um, uh, protests, which got more and more violent, more and more extensive um, in the following couple of months, would not have happened. And the, you see, the Chinese government started to use the term color revolution to describe what was happening in Hong Kong in, I think, in July, late July or early August. Right? So uh, my point is, if, if the, the central government were not convinced that a, that a, a color revolution was actually taking place in Hong Kong, then I don't think uh, we would have seen what, what Beijing did in response to that. Yeah, you agree? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, Douglas Wong, a longtime FCC member, just speaking for myself. Um, it's kind of a follow-up to that, and also what Keith had asked you earlier, which was, do you believe that there were foreign forces behind this so-called color revolution. And correct me if I'm wrong, but your answer was all the US politicians expressed support for the Hong Kong protesters. It would have been a dereliction of duty for the CIA not to foment a color revolution. That's not, I mean, we are all open-minded. I would love you to share with us more information about how foreign forces were malignly doing evil here. I don't know. <laughs> how, how am I supposed to know? I mean, if, if we already have the um, uh, national security branch in the police, then maybe they would know. How would I know? I mean, it, to me, it's, it's pure logic. We, I heard a US uh, diplomat telling me in person how proud he was that his government played a very important role in the color revolution in one of those uh, Central Asian states some years ago, and he was there. And he said, we helped the government. It actually told me how the, uh, the, the, the American government sort of helped the people in that country overthrow the, uh, their dictator. So, I mean, to me, I would think that the United States government and their politicians, uh, or most of them, would regard it as their mission to support, not only, not only in word, but substantively as well, any fight for democracy all over the world. Otherwise, how do you lead the democracy movement? Right? So I mean, I would be very surprised indeed if uh, they had you no know, set back and done nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our pan Democrats friends would be angry with them. Huh? Mm -hmm. You just say, you just say that you support us, but what have you done? Mm -hmm. They have the right to ask that. Mm -hmm. Got a question over here. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Tom Fu. I'm a Hong Kong lawyer. Um, 
Mr. Zhang, I believe you've set um, a key indicator of the success of China's one country, two system is whether the central government will resume dialogue with the pandemocrats. Now, if you um, were to convey one message to the pandemocrats today, what would that message be? Thank you. First of all, let me, let me, let me uh, uh, correct your statement a little bit. I, I, I'm not saying that a key uh, sort of uh, criterion for one country, two systems to, to be successful is uh, this re resumption of dialogue. I see that as something that, have, that has to take place um, because of what has happened in the past two or three years. I see that this resumption of dialogue to be necessary for one country, two systems to sort of move on uh, successfully, right? And uh, as I said, I, I maybe, maybe the time is not right yet for, for either side to, uh, to do anything really uh, useful, really effective. Um, but uh, I noticed that at least some of my friends in the uh, pandemocrats camp I believe they have been doing the right things. They've been, well, let me, let, let me say this. To me, most members of the pandemocrat, uh, uh, democratic camp, most of them satisfy the uh, requirements, the conditions for being patriotic. I have no doubt about that. And, and not only, it's, it, it, it's not only me saying that. I mean, the former head of the uh, Hong Kong Macarthur Affairs Office, uh, Wang, the, 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 Wang Guangya, the, yes. And he said, when he met with the, uh, the, 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 the Let's Go members some years ago, he said he, something similar to that. The central government is not against anyone in the pandemocrats camp because most of the, 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 the members of the pandemocrats camp are patriotic, right? So that I, I have no doubt about that. But because of what happened in 2019, and although maybe these, uh, for example, the, uh, the declaration to sort of uh, 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 force the Hong Kong government to accede to their political demand, Although it, it came perhaps from the most uh, radical uh, faction in the, in the whole camp, but the, the, the idea, the, the strategy of the whole camp then was to stay together. They were not sort of, what is it in English? They were not, huh? They, they were not you know, draw a line between themselves and, 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 the, and the radicals. Right? So this is what uh, sort of worried the central government. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more from the floor here, and then I'll have well, maybe two more. I hate one from the back. Thanks. Yeah. My name is Dan, also a longtime FCC member. Um, you've talked a lot about sort of reconciliation. You've talked about sort of some of the pan-democrats kind of doing the right thing. Uh, and I would just be very curious to hear you articulate kind of what you think the concerns are of the pandemocrats um, that the government can reasonably address if there were some sort of reconciliation eventually. Because obviously something probably also in addition to foreign forces was motivating people onto the streets. Like there's clearly something there. And I would be interested to know kind of what you think that thing is and how the Hong Kong government can realistically address it. I think, I think the, uh, the problem started in uh, 2014 or perhaps 2013 when we were, when we were sort of uh, working on uh, the sort of final stage of our political development. Uh, trying to work out 
uh, how the chief executive should be elected by universal suffrage in 2017. And the, the pandemocrats, perhaps, many of them, um, believed that uh, um, their, their reading of the basic law was that uh, it should be what they call genuine universal suffrage, no uh, pre-selection by the central government. Right? So they, uh, many of them, I believe, genuinely thought that uh, that was what uh, uh, the Chinese government had already promised them. And so when uh, the, um, the uh, proposal came from the central government, uh, they refused to accept it. And what's more, they believed that by mobilizing the people, and that's, that's why they wanted to start the uh, Occupy Central campaign. They believed that by mobilizing a large enough number of people into the streets, they could force the central government to uh, sort of, I mean, accede to their, their demands, which of course was, was wrong. I tried to convince them, them that it was the wrong move, but, but then they did it, and of course they didn't, they didn't manage to get what, what they wanted. And many of the young people who took part in the, uh, in the Occupy Central movement back in 2014-2015, uh, they were very they were very disappointed and they were very angry. They thought they had fought, you know, bravely, but they got nothing. And so in 2019, they said, look, this time we have to win. We cannot lose again. And the pandemic had supported them. Hmm? And yes, I think we all want to see the Hong Kong electoral systems going more and more democratic. But at the same time, at the same time, uh, I think it is fair to say that we, we neglected the uh, basic um, requirement set out by Deng Xiaoping when he talked about one country, two systems. Hong Kong must be run by a government which is sort of dominated by uh, patriots. And when the central government saw that, that the existing system could not guarantee that, so they set out to change it. And uh, I, I believe the pandemic, as they have now, they should sort of reorientate, reorientate themselves and find a new goal. And one last question from the audience here, and then we'll wrap it up. I know people have to get back to work. <laughs> Um, hi, Mr. Sang. Uh, my name is Hillary, and I'm a member of the FCC. Um, my question is about press freedom in Hong Kong, which is obviously a very pertinent topic for us here at the club. Um, our new chief executive, John Lee, has made sort of a curious analogy in the past, comparing press freedom to something, uh, comparing press freedom to a uh, HKID card that we always have in our pockets. Um, but meanwhile, we've plunged down um, a global index on press freedom. Um, Apple Daily, Stan News outlets have shut in the past year and their editors are facing charges. So it's um, a radically different media landscape from when you were let go president. So um, do you agree with John Lee that Hong Kong still has press freedom or um, do you tend to think perhaps the space for reporters in Hong Kong to do their job has narrowed? I, I, I can only say this. We have not yet, we have not yet recovered from the, uh, from the uh, trauma of 2019, we have to view, we have to look at our current situation, look at what's happening now in Hong Kong in its context. As I said, the, uh, the 2019 uh, protest, 2019 turbulence, uh, was a big shock both to uh, the central government and to many Hong Kong people. We uh, uh, personally, I would hope that uh, when 
when we have sort of, when we are able to put behind us what happened uh, three years ago, then maybe our life will become, will go back to normal and we would be in a better position to assess whether all of the, uh, whether any of the uh, uh, freedoms, liberties, rights promised in the basic law uh, have been uh, sort of eroded. But it is not a good, I mean, it's not a good time to make that assessment now, I, I believe. Well, before I let you go, since you were a long-time visitor here, you were here 25 years ago speaking at the FCC, to follow up on that question about press freedom, what, uh, what role do you think the FCC plays <laughs> and should continue to play in Hong Kong's development? Send an invitation to John Lee to come and speak to you. <laughs> I, would, I, I will definitely do that. <laughs> you think he should come? I think he should come. Well... Yeah. And sit where you're sitting and answer questions? Pardon? And sit where you're sitting and answer questions from... Why not? Okay. Can I tell him you said that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you can. I mean, he may not remember who I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but I, think, I, think, I think it's fair to say that he did better, perhaps much better, than uh, many people expected uh, at the Let's Go uh, mm -hmm. Q&A session yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did, he, did, he did quite well. Okay, well, that's the headline. Jasper Jung says John Lee should come to FCC. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you. You should ask him to come. Yeah, I should ask him to come. I want to thank you very much for uh, coming and sharing your views with us and answering all the questions here. It wasn't too difficult, was it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being a great thank audience. You, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.